Thank you. Uh, so let's get started. This talk is about how to make your logs work for you. And I, I decided to, to give this presentation because I see a trend that we, or any company, any business, uh, generates a lot of data. And the data is often, go, uh, often just wasted, not even stored, or just stored and never, never ever touched, never utilized. And I would like to show you a collection of tools that you can use to get something out of your data, get some insights into how your business works, how your operations work, and what are, uh, what are the areas uh, that you can improve on or that you need to, you need to watch more closely. That's sort of the high level motivation to do something with all the data that you can get. Uh, so I will be talking mostly about logs, but if you, if you think about it, what is actually a log? Uh, for us to call something a log record, it needs to have several properties. First one, it needs to have a timestamp. It occurred sometime in, in, the, in the time continuum. It's not an object that's universally valid. And also, once it's created, it barely ever changes. Probably it doesn't change at all, because it's a record of history. So we will talk and give examples about log records from your servers and from your application and everything. But you can also think of this set of tools to process things like an activity stream, like Twitter or something like that, because those records actually have the same properties. They have a timestamp, and once issued, they never change. So it should be transferable to other areas than just storing machine-generated logs. So that is sort of uh, the idea. Because we do have log lines, and we're very familiar with those. Like whenever you ran an Apache web server or anything else, you probably had to look into the logs to figure out what's going on. Uh, there, is, there is also the Twitter feed. But there is also a more important part that we can actually fit together and gain, uh, gain some more information out of it. For example, if you combine the logs from multiple sources, and not just technical sources, those are useful too if you can combine the logs that are coming from your web server and from your load balancer and from your database, that's great, you get a lot of information that way. But if you can also include the information about uh, your deploys, about the state of your environment, about uh, your business side of things, for example, do you have an ad campaign running somewhere or not, and, and which one, and, and how it is, uh, what, is, what is actually happening in the application, not just the operation side, but uh, yes, people are coming to your website, but what are they doing there? What are they looking at? Uh, so you can correlate all these information. You can even just store the metrics uh, the same way, like the metrics about your CPU utilization and disk usage and all that stuff. You don't have to have different separate systems. In fact, you shouldn't, because if you just have one system, you can put everything together and see everything together, how it, how it correlates, and you don't have to do any extra work. And essentially, computers are all about doing less work. So we should, we should make use of that. So that covers pretty much the, uh, the why question. Primarily, it is to answer the question, what happened last Tuesday? Uh, especially if it's last Tuesday at 3 AM, where uh, hopefully you were, uh, you were sound asleep and fairly happy. Uh, something happened in your production environment. So how do you find out? what it was and what led to it. How do you debug the issue? So there's the time-honored solution is you just use grep. But that falls apart fairly quickly. Because if you, have, if you have multiple machines, then you have to SSH to all of them and run the grep and then maybe try and combine it. If you have more than one web server, you have, uh, you have multiple files. And also, you just don't want to look at the individual log records. You want to sort of see an overview. You want to see some, uh, see some visualization, some analysis of what's actually going on. And most importantly, you want to see what actually happened at 3 AM, which theoretically should be doable with grep, which you might think so if you've actually never seen a log record. Because every sort of creator of software has their own idea 
how to represent daytime. So is this last Tuesday or not? And how do you filter from this time to last Tuesday at 3 a.m.? I have honestly no clue whatsoever. Uh, this one, well, maybe, but what's the year? This one, yes, that is, that's, that's the standard, but again, it would be very difficult, very difficult to filter on a, a time slice using grep. So that is sort of one of the most visible uh, obstacles when you want to do this sort of thing manually. You want something that will actually uh, collect all your logs and normalize all these things and provide you with a unified interface to your logs. So uh, that's one part. And the second part is, as I already, already uh, talked about, to gather all the logs from all the different systems. For, for example, if you correlate uh, your logs or your events from your web server and your load balancer, you can immediately see any sort of discrep uh, discrepancies that aren't supposed to be there. Uh, for example, if, if the load traffic is the same for the web servers and for the load balancer. That means that the load balancer is not doing its job when it is supposed to be caching some stuff or serving the static files directly. And that might be difficult to see, but if you, if you look at it, if you're able to visualize it and see it all together, you should be able to notice it immediately. Uh, other use case might be if you have web server versus database. If the traffic on web server grows, and the number of queries to your database grows as well. That's again an indication that your probably caching doesn't work. Or you might have that uh, the, the traffic to the database is growing, whereas your traffic for the web server remains constant. So probably the users are hitting some page that actually generates a lot more queries than what you're used to. So again, it's a clear signal that you should pay attention to something and you can use this system to narrow down into what's, what's going on. Uh, another example might be uh, uh, if you manage to get information about your deploys, about your environment into it, uh, then you can see that, hey, after this deploy, these things changed. Database usage went down, and that's, that is good. Probably we are caching or we are being more effective, unless it's because we are just failing horribly and uh, people are not seeing anything. So e if you get all these information into the same place, you can get much more, uh, much more out of it. And it's much easier. Because sure, you can do all of these if you, if you store the logs separately. You can do the comparison between how much traffic goes into the database and how much to the web server. But at that point, you, you have to look for it. If it's already there, if you can only ask and, and see the picture, you can actually uh, even see things that you didn't know you should be looking for. So the last example is, for example, traffic versus ad campaigns. So you can actually even derive business value out of, out of uh, such a system. You can see that if an ad campaign uh, works and you can see it in real time. Like, hey, we're running this ad campaign and we see the web traffic uh, rise on these URLs. And that actually directly translates into higher load on the server. So you can immediately, from one picture, you can see the impact on your organization. Hey, I paid this much for an ad, I'm getting this much traffic, and I'm spending this much on, on electricity, on, on CPU power. So the, the concept of correlating uh, data from different sources is very powerful. And it is one of the uh, best motivat uh, motivators to actually go into, into centralized logging. So let's see what we actually need for, uh, for the centralized logging. What are the, the necessary steps and components of such a system? Uh, so first we need to uh, have a central storage. We need to put everything into one place where we can actually do something with it. And it needs to be able to cope with data from different systems that can uh, look dramatically different. Because if you're storing metrics about your CPU, that's just numbers, whereas if you're storing information about uh, your visitors to your website, that's an entirely different animal because you care about their user agent and the geographic location that they came from and what page they were looking into. So different, uh, different 
kind of data and also from different sources. You also want to enrich the data. You don't want to just take the data from the logs and put them directly in there. You want to do something to it. For example, if you have an IP address there, you might want to do a geo IP lookup to see where the visitor is coming from. If you have an IP address, you want to change it into a host name for your internal systems. If you have a terrible, terrible string of user agent, you might want to normalize it into saying it's, it's Chrome version 72 or something along those lines. If you have that the user hit this URL, you might want to ask your application what's on that URL. What piece of content, what did the user actually see? So you can see that, uh, for example, you can tie it into your, if you have a content website, uh, you can say that this author, uh, hit their articles are being read this, this much. If you, if you collect this information. You want to be able to analyze the data. So uh, most importantly, you want to be able to visualize it. Because visualizations are super powerful, we'll see some examples, because it allows us humans to do what we do best, uh, look at something and find a pattern, or more precisely, a deviation from a pattern. Because we can do that very easily if, if we just look at stuff. If we wanted a computer to do it, we would have to first teach it what to look for. And so that means that we can only catch those things that we expect. But by definition, those are not as useful or not as insightful as events that we don't expect. So uh, the, about, uh, the ability to do analysis and, and visualize the data is super important. And also, you want to be able to search. You want to be able to narrow down, down the results. You don't always want to be uh, looking at the whole data set, because that leads you nowhere. That gives you the information through the visualizations on the data that something is going on, and maybe, maybe about even what is going on, but not the cause. It's only when you can narrow down the data set while still looking at the same visualizations, seeing them change, you can narrow down what's actually causing the problem. And this actually transfer, uh, transforms into another requirement that we have for such a system. It needs to be real time, more or less. We cannot just uh, ch do a search and ask for a visualization and, and then go for coffee and, and wait five minutes or two hours for the system to finish its work. Because at that point, you cannot do the ad hoc discovery. So it needs to be, needs to be real time. So once we have all this, we, we have, sorry, we have everything that we need for, uh, for centralized logging. So the, 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 uh, that was the, the product overview, what we, what we need from the system. So how do we get there? There are several steps that such a system needs to provide. First of all, it needs to collect the data and parse the data. So it needs to either sit on, the, on all the systems that you have and consume the data and send them somewhere. They need to be able to parse all the different formats, remember the, remember the different uh, time formats. It needs to be able to do, go through that, normalize it into something that's, that the final storage will understand. It needs to be able to enrich the data. And finally, uh, store, it, uh, store it in some location that will allow uh, the, uh, the search and the aggregations for, to drive the visualizations. Because that is the most important part. That is the end result. That is why we are going through this entire exercise. So that was sort of the, the, uh, the theory that, that is behind all this. So how, do, how would that look in practice when you use, when you use ELK? Elk is, uh, Elk is an open source collection of tools. It's Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, that actually can provide you with, uh, with the functionality to do, these, uh, to do these steps. More exactly, how it fits in is Logstash is actually responsible uh, for the data ingestion pipeline. So it, it is the system that will go and collect the data it will parse it. it. It has all the necessary tools uh, to do the parsing and to do the enrichment. <coughs> so this is Logstash. This is actually the logo of Logstash. It's a log with a stash. 
So not much imagination there. And to sort of continue with that trend, uh, this is uh, Elasticsearch, which is actually the data store that we choose to store the data in. It is a distributed search engine that can actually take all the data in there and has some very nice features that we'll go over that enable all these, uh, uh, all these things that we needed to do. And finally, there is Kibana, which is uh, uh, the most impressive, but yet the technologically most simple part of the stack. That's the visualizations tool. It actually talks to Elasticsearch. It uses Elasticsearch to do all the number crunching, and it will provide you with gorgeous pictures and your, your users with the ability to define their own dashboards, their own visualizations. So it is a very, very important part, and it represents the final result. So let's take these one, one at a time. First is, first is Logstash. As I said, it's essentially a data ingestion pipeline. So how it works is we have a couple of inputs, and we can see that there are, there are plenty of different types of input. And then we have uh, a lot of filters. Filters are those that do the parsing and, and, and enrichment. And then we have a bunch of outputs. So these, this is like a selection of the, of the inputs. We can see uh, some of the most important ones. We can have a file, we can read from a queue somewhere, or we can, we can actually even read from, uh, from some data store. So we can consume data from, uh, from an existing system. Once we have that data, uh, we uh, run them through a series of filters. And there's a bunch of filters, and uh, these aren't even all of the filters. There's a, a lot of community filters out there, and even uh, inputs and outputs, because Logstash is actually written in <coughs> JRuby. Uh, but uh, that makes it easy for people to contribute uh, uh, different, different plugins. And also for you, if you have any sort of uh, custom uh, use case, you can define your own plugin. So I just highlighted a few very interesting plugins that I find are super useful or otherwise hard to replicate on your own. Uh, my favorite uh, is Anonymize that can actually take the data, hash them into, uh, into something that's unrecognizable. So if you, for example, process some personal information, you can just, you can just use Anonymize to hash it, so you still re regain the, the correlation between all the requests that were done by the same user, but you no longer have the username in your logs. That means that you can actually expose it to, uh, to public, or not probably public, but the rest of the company. Then there is the GeoIP filter that will do just that. It will take an IP address and give you the location. There's Grok to simplify the parsing. There is a multi-line to actually squash multiple lines of logs into, into one message. If, for example, if you want to store, which you should, something like tracebacks, uh, exceptions from your, from your scripts and applications. Another one, super useful one, is the user agent that takes the crazy string that, um, that all the browsers sent and will actually normalize it into the normalized name of the browser, version, operating system, and maybe some other useful information. So these are pre-built for you, and you can mash them together to define your own pipeline. And then you have, uh, again, a different set of outputs. Uh, the, for us, the most important one for the stock is the Elasticsearch one. But you can also have output like for email or IRC. So you can have like a filter in there that says, if this is really important log message, just send it to me over email or, or ping pager duty because it's really important. I need to know that this is happening right now. Maybe some security logs or something, uh, something along those lines. So you can sort of have uh, the one pipeline and you can branch it. So you can uh, say, put everything into Elasticsearch and put the monitoring stuff into Graphite as well. And then for the super important part, uh, just email me and, and ping me on Jabber and maybe put it into, put it into Google Cloud Storage and file, uh, file a ticket in Jira. Because why not? So uh, different outputs. So th these are the three components that together uh, compose a sort of a logstash, logstash configuration. So that's the logstash part.
So where does Elasticsearch fit in? Elasticsearch is the storage. It is a distributed search engine. It is open source, so you can just download it and install it. And it is, uh, it is document based, so it actually stores JSON documents. So literally anything that you can express as JSON, you can store and analyze inside Elasticsearch. It is based on the Apache Lucy license, and its primary mode of communication is HTTP and JSON, so it's fairly user-friendly to talk to. So how it actually works, uh, how do we store and organize data inside Elasticsearch for this use case? So as I said, Elasticsearch is distributed, which means that uh, at the very top, we have a cluster. So a cluster is just a collection of Elasticsearch nodes. So we have three nodes, they, they are most likely on three different machines. When I, when I started those nodes, they found each other, they said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the login cluster. You too? Yeah, sure. So let's, let's come together, let's form one cluster and, and work together. Then we have indices. So index is essentially uh, the structure where document live. An index is internally split into, split into shards. So when I create an index, we will have an index inside the nodes, but what is actually stored on the nodes are the shards. Shards are the units of scale for Elasticsearch. So you can think of an index as just a collection of shards with some metadata, but shards are the important part. We have uh, primary and replica shards that we have distributed across the cluster. So in a configuration like this, it might look something like this. So we have two indices here. We have an index for orders and index for products. For products, we have two shards and zero replicas. So you see only two primary shards. But for the orders index, we actually have four shards, each with one, one replica. If we were to add one more node, Elasticsearch will just say, hey, there is an empty node and we have more, more shards here, so let's just redistribute it. So it will probably take like these two shards and move it to the, uh, to the new node. And all of this will happen transparently, so uh, the user will never know, the, the cluster will never stop answering questions and accepting more data to read. Also, there is no such concept of master or slave node. That is all on the shard level. We just have a uniform cluster. You can actually talk to any of the nodes and it will always give you answer to any, uh, any question that you might have. And it will also accept any API call. You don't have to know wh uh, where the data actually lives. So this sort of organization has some very interesting uh, connotations because we have the indices and the collection of shards. So that essentially means when I do a search over an index, what happens internally is Elasticsearch will figure out which shards do I need to talk to and send the search to all of those shards and then gather the results back and send them over to the user. What that implies is it really doesn't matter if I search across one index with five shards or five indices with one shard each. There is no performance penalty. There is no overhead for doing that. And that is very good news for us because that means that for our logging solution, we can actually create an index per day or per week. And then when we want to actually query the whole index, yeah, uh, the whole data set, we ju just query all the indices. But typically we will only query the index for today or today and yesterday. And we can uh, instruct also Elasticsearch to treat these indices a little bit differently. So when you have a time-based uh, uh, index, time-based indices, what you can do, for example, is you can say that the current index, the index for today that I'm actively writing to, that I'm actively searching through and doing a lot of analysis on it, have it on the part of the cluster that's composed of a beefier machines. Because you can actually uh, give Elasticsearch the information, what is your cluster composition? The nodes don't have to be the same size, the same shape. So you can say for the current indices, keep them on the strong boxes and keep two replicas so the, re, uh, so the reads have really high throughput. Then for the week old data, you can, uh, you can say that 
yeah, they're probably complete. I'll not write to them anymore. So create a snapshot somewhere in like S3 or somewhere, uh, somewhere say for archival purposes. And also just keep one replica. Like remove all the redundancies. Hey, if I lose data, if I lose a node, yes, I'll lose some, lose some data, but I already have the snapshot, so I'm okay with that. And I don't want uh, to dedicate that many resources to a data that are week old that probably not that many people use. And we can go on. If it's a month old, just move them to the weaker part of the cluster. So now they live on the boxes that don't have SSDs, but spinning disks, so it's much cheaper to run. And I don't care how many indices are in there. I can still query them. It just will take a little bit longer to get the results. Hey, that's fine. It's a month old data. Who cares? And if it's, if it's even longer, just close the indices. That means that they will still remain on disk and I can reopen them. It will take a few minutes maybe to make it accessible again. But while they're closed, they will not consume any resources as part of the cluster. They will not eat memory. They will not eat um, other resources like file descriptors and stuff. And then finally, after three months, I can just delete them. Remember, I still have the snapshot. And when I delete them, I will delete the entire index, which in, in uh, Elasticsearch means I will just delete a, a bunch of files on disk. That is why uh, one of the reasons, or that demonstrates the reason why we recommend that people use indices per day. Because if you have an index per year and you want to delete one month worth of data in it, that's a super expensive operation. You need to find all the record, uh, records um, mark them as deleted, and then wait for some garbage collection to come in and actually reclaim the space, uh, the, the equivalent of vacuum in, in uh, other data stores. Uh, so that is super expensive. But if you have all the data in, in, one, in one index together and you want to delete it, super simple, delete a file on disk, cheap. So this is the set of... Uh, uh, characteristics for Elasticsearch that actually make it suitable to store time-based data. Uh, because we can do this workflow, we even have a tool called, uh, called Curator, and that one is actually written in Python, uh, that uh, help you with uh, all these steps to define all these politics and, and govern uh, the moving of the indices along your, along your cluster. So now we have the data stored, we have them organized per day, uh, and also what we can do here is we can have different number of shards for each day. Uh, because when we start with the system, when we first play with it, it will be fairly small because we will deploy it to one system at a time. So we can start with just one shard a day. And then later as our organization grows, we probably cannot fit into that one shard anymore. So we will, from now on, we'll be creating two shards every day, three shards, and so on. So it again helps you uh, to not commit. You don't have to think hard and do all the analysis of how big a box is you need, how big a cluster, and how many shards. You can just start and then adapt to it as situation changes. Because you know, no, no two constants remain the same when it comes to software engineering. So this, is, this, was, uh, this was Elasticsearch that, that allows us to store it. And it also allows us to analyze the data. And that's where Kibana comes in. Kibana is a, is a JavaScript application that looks something like this. This is a dashboard created in, uh, in Kibana. Uh, so, and it visualizes some data that it got out of Elasticsearch, some aggregated data. And you can see several things here. First of all, you probably notice that there is a gap here. This is what I was talking about. When a person looks at this, they know that there is a gap. And you see it immediately. That is the entire reason why we are visualizing our data, so that we can see a pattern. Uh, here we can see an aggregation of our visitors to our website. And you can see it's a multidimensional aggregation. So we have one pi for each country. Then for each country we have uh, the user split based whether they were logged in or not logged in. And immediately you can see that there are some countries that are drastically different. And for each of those categories, we also split them 
uh, by which, which browser they're, uh, they're using. So you can see that you can create multidimensional aggregations and visualize them very effectively using, using Kibana. And that allows you to immediately sp uh, spot the outliers, uh, the, the exceptions to the pattern, uh, the deviations like, like this gap. What you can do now here is just zoom in and see how everything else changes. So you will now see that uh, in this area, compared to this one, where you can zoom into as well, like the, the traffic to all your articles dropped, or, or maybe you will see refer, uh, referrals here. And you can see that this was actually because, uh, I don't know, Facebook was down. So people couldn't click on link, the links that lead to your website. And because this is in near real time, so whatever you do, if you, if you click here that you want to only select this country, or if you, if you drag a, a, a range here to sort of zoom into that time period, it will only take at most a few seconds to actually redraw everything. And that is what allows uh, the ad hoc discovery. You don't have to ask a query and then wait, go for a coffee, or, or uh, God forbid, go home and then come back the next day to see the result. You can also uh, put a, a search query in there. So let's say that you're only interested in, in requests that actually contain a certain keyword. And you can use all the power of Elasticsearch, so all the full text search. You can use fuzzy searches, prefix searches. And again, once you put the search in, everything will withdraw. You can even look into the individual records. So you can see the frequency as they go in time. And you can see the individual records. You can drill down into the JSON. Uh, it might be a little blurry, but if you get a better monitor, it will, actually, it will actually work fine. So you can see the actual record and really see what's, what's going on there. So these are all the components. So just quickly, how do they fit together? So first of all, we have something to collect the data. We can use Logstash, but it can be a little heavy, as I mentioned. It's actually written in, uh, in JRuby, so it requires a JVM to run. So there are other shippers. Uh, some people, for example, use uh, just our syslog or syslog ng, which can actually ship data over, over the network. And the shipping over the network can be either direct or you can just stuff it into a queue. You can, you can use Redis, you can use Postgres, why not? You can, you can use Kafka or uh, whatever. And then, and then my mouse goes crazy. Sorry about that. Yeah, this one is out. So I'll be moving over here. So you can, uh, you can uh, put it into a queue, and then you have a the full-blown log stash that will actually receive the data. So here, if you're using log stash, here as the input, you will have file. You might do some enrichment, for example, include which host you actually collected this on. And then the output will be either the queue or it will just be the network. And here the input will be, again, either the queue or the network. You will de do all the expensive enrichment that you don't want to do on the production boxes. Uh, you will do all of that here. And then you just uh, load it into, into Elasticsearch. And then uh, comes Kibana that just talks to, talks to Elasticsearch. This is a fairly lightweight thing. It's just a small daemon in Node.js. And, most of it is actually happening in the browser. And any of these, any of these layers, you can, you can scale as you wish. Obviously, you will have a shipper probably at, uh, at each of your boxes. You will have a bunch of log stashes if you, if you grow past the one. And then you just, use a, you just use a queue. You just use something like Kafka or RabbitMQ or Redis to actually distribute the load. So you'll have 1,000 machines here, a queue, five machines here, and 10 machines here, because again, Elasticsearch is a clustered solution. So you can just add more nodes, uh, tell Logstash to, to talk to all of them, and it will just distribute the load. And Elasticsearch will internally also distribute the shards across the cluster. 
So it is a very scalable solution. If you want to scale any of the parts, just throw more money at it, um, sorry, machines at it, and it will, it will scale out. We have seen deployments that, that, uh, that write uh, hundreds, and, uh, hundreds of thousands of requests per second into, through this pipeline, so it can, it can take you fairly, uh, fairly far. So that was sort of the centralized logging in, in a nutshell. So we do have a little time left. So we, can, we have a bonus chapter. One other interesting product that, that we have that might also be usable is, is PacketBeat. And uh, PacketBeat is a, a little tiny little daemon that you give a simple configuration like this. You say that uh, I, I run something that speaks HTTP on ports 80 and 8,000. I run MySQL on port uh, 3306. I run Redis, etc. And then uh, PacketBeat will automatically go and, and intercept the messages and log them. So you can get an overview of what's actually going on. You can, you can see all, all, the, all the Postgres queries. You can see all the HTTP. Uh, query split by uh, split by the status, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. And all you need is a configuration like that, uh, root privileges, <laughs> and and one and one simple binary. But it is open source. You can actually see that we are not doing anything untowards with your root privileges. And this is actually a screenshot from a from a demo that we have that we have live that you can uh, go look uh, look into. Uh, that actually shows uh, shows the real data. Uh, another thing that I'll mention is, if you do logging, you might as well go the extra step. For example, add a session ID, so we can group all the log messages that co uh, connect to one top-level event together. Uh, for web, it's just a ses session ID, and then you get bonus points. If you can track this, the session ID through the different microservices that you have, so if you if you have if you have an application that talks to a service, just send the session ID, and then have the service also log the session ID, and that that way you can very easily see how the request is moving through and how it impacts your entire environment, not just one service at a time, because yes, you can put them all together into one system and correlate what's going on. But you cannot uh, do it unless you add the session ID on a per request basis. So you only see you only see correlation. It's much harder to see the actual causality, how things go. It is always better to log in directly as in JSON format, so you don't have to spend a lot of time parsing and writing the parse rules, which are easy to write but still uh, still a, a, a pain somewhere. Uh, include the metrics, like uh, people often are afraid to combine the metrics with their log system and there is no need uh, to actually uh, do that and you can actually include the CPU and all the hardcore metrics with your logging system. You can use Elasticsearch search for that and you can benefit from uh, seeing the correlations. So if you have the session ID, or if that's a use case that might be interesting to you, I recommend you look, look up a talk by Mark Harwood, one of, one of our guys, about entity-centric indexing. It's essentially a talk about how you take the different events that you have and roll them into, into actually entities. So in this case, I'm not interested in, in request has started and request has ended, but how long did the session take? which is an impossible question to answer when you're looking at individual events. But if you roll them up, according to uh, Mark's rules, you can actually uh, answer those questions. And you can use, use Elasticsearch for that. So highly, highly re uh, recommend his talk. He has some very nice examples of what you can do there. And the last tip I'll leave you with is that if you're, if you're uh, fortunate enough uh, to run Hadoop, you can actually just ingest the data directly from Hadoop into, into Elasticsearch. We have a connector there. So if you have all the data in, in HDFS and you have no idea what to do with them, 
ju just put them into Elasticsearch and now you can actually do something with them uh, in, in like not a glacial time scale, but actually while you're looking at it. So a uh, few more pieces of information because uh, before we go into questions, first of all, we have, a, we have an Elasticsearch meetup here in, in, in the city on Tuesday. If you look up uh, meetup.com and DevOps Brisbane, uh, there is a meetup on, on Tuesday. I'm not sure if there are any more spots, but I think there are. And uh, we'll be talking more about, uh, about Elk Stack. And if you come from Sydney, we'll do the same, same there on Thursday. There is actually an Elasticsearch meetup group there, and we'll have a meetup on Thursday. So if you have any questions, you can ask now, or you can track me down, or you can actually track my colleague Joshua, who has all the, all the questions to all the answers. And thank you very much for coming and, and listening to me. Yes, thank you, Hunter. Just a question about packet beat. Um, we run everything over SSL over our networks. To how does packet beat deal with that? It will automatically decrypt it. <laughs> and I, no, it won't work. Okay. <laughs> We're not that good. <laughs> so any other questions? Anyone else? I will also remind you that we have some swag on, on the table because we are a sponsor of the, of the conference, so you can grab some stickers for, for our logo or, or for, for Packet Bead, and it's, it's all there. So thank you very much, and see you around. Oh, freebies. Thanks, Hamza. <laughs>